me at the 11th verse of Luke chapter 15. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods or the food that the swine ate and no one gave him anything but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger I will arise and go to my father and will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Finally, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I want to speak this morning, the part two of what my wife started on last week, entitled An Orphan Spirit, The Path to Sonship. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would bless me with your grace and your anointing, Lord God, to proclaim your truth. Let it be clear. Let it be impactful. Let it make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. I have just set forth that this is the second part of what we started on last week, speaking about the orphan spirit. The orphan spirit is a biblical truth that many people who have gone to church for many, many years may not necessarily be familiar with. And so if you've never heard this before, uh, I want to encourage you to look on our Facebook page or our YouTube and you can listen to last week's sermon where my wife went into a whole lot more detail than I am going to go into today because it is such an important insight. It is such an important revelation uh, because the spirit, this orphan spirit, plagues way too many people. Now, while we read just now the account of the, par the uh, prodigal son, I want to say to you that this is not just to the male gender that can be impacted by an orphan spirit, but it is 
both men and women, that can be greatly affected by this spiritual opponent. It is a spiritual opponent. Now, I will tell you that what we just read, it, it marks the model of Jesus in his earthly uh, operation. He, he used parables a lot. And he used them formally and he used them informally. It is, what is a parable? It is a heavenly story uh, with a divine message. It is a story. A parable is a story with a divine message. Now the differentiator uh, between a story and a Jesus type story or a parable is the divine message. There's something that is seeking to be communicated of, of spiritual gravity. And so it is that we find in Luke 15 where Jesus is presenting thank you so much he's presenting the parable of the prodigal son now I want you to recognize that the truth that is in the parable cannot be overstated it cannot be overstated. He did it this way because one, someone said, is he was trying to help somebody to grasp the truth, but he was also trying to help veil the truth. My prayer for you today is that you are not veiled from this truth, but that this truth pierces your very heart because he desperately wants us to rise above the limiting factor of the spirit of an orphan. So I want to share a parable with you this morning, a story. It is under the light of an East Harlem street on a cold October evening that a group of young people played some touch football their game was interrupted on an occasion of some uh, of a slow walking man. He, he was just walking across the field, interfering with their game, as well as some passing cars. And so on the sidewalk, three older men were gathered together, huddled up as is often in, in many urban uh, uh, settings. They were gathered in a doorway having a conversation while this man was walking across the playing field. And, 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 and they watched as a man hobbled uh, out of the shadows of that conclave, that group of, of, of conversation. And he, they, 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 there was once one of them, rather, that came out from that doorway. And as they watched him, the man, they asked, they said, can you please hurry up and get out of the way? The young football players exclaimed because they were, they were trying to carry on in their game. And, and, and as the man walked across, he began to tell them, I have some calendars and I have... Uh, some greeting cards and they were angered by his response they wanted to continue to play their game they didn't want to buy any calendar or greeting card as he uh, heard their anger and their frustration he was greeted by the man who left the doorway the man who left the doorway said, he said, Joe Hammond, is that you? The destroyer? He said, yeah, it's me. It's me. He said, it's been a long time. How have you been? He said, 
I've seen better days. Right now, I'm just trying to get something to eat, said the man with the greeting cards and the calendar. You see, the man stopped and asked that question with surprise on his face because this man who was selling greeting cards and calendars was no ordinary man. He was a special dude. In fact, he was a legend. Joe Hammond is the only person history records that got drafted by the LA Lakers and he never played high school ball. He never played college ball. But the Lakers came looking for him. Why? Because he is one of the street ball legends of New York City. It is said that Joe Hammond, who was such an incredible talent, had the owner and the general manager from the Lakers to come to Rucker Park to look at the tournament games that Joe Hammond played in, trying to convince him to come and play for the Lakers. Never played in high school, never played in college. It was in 1971 that this same Joe Hammond faced a person by the name of Julius Dr. J. Irvin and quietly dropped 50 cold points on Dr. J. But now he's walking across a cement touch football field, trying to sell greeting cards and calendars to young boys simply trying to play. How could something like this happen? How is it that this man, who seemed to be so desirable, now finds himself in such an undesirable place? How is it that, that this man who, who is still spoken of today with such admiration can lose his way so painfully? The record is that Jack Kent Cook, who was the owner of the Lakers at that time, offered him $50,000 on the spot if he would sign with the Lakers. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar holds him in high esteem, saying that it was he was one of the greatest to come out of New York City. In fact, it was Wilt Chamberlain who sent the owner of the Lakers to New York City to watch him, to bring him back to L.A. so that they could win a championship. How could this happen to such a promising athlete? At his own words, he says, I lost all possession and prospect. He says, he says, I look back now and I realize that I was just a knucklehead. These are the words of Hammond himself. I was just a knucklehead. See, Hammond looked twice. He, he went, excuse me, he, he went to prison uh, twice. And, and, and he's able, somehow or another, sitting in, in a prison cell has a way of of humbling you and making you think about the path that you've chosen. In low tone, Hammond admitted to having sold drugs and, 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 and huge drugs. And many people will ascribe and say, that was his problem when I want you to say, I want you, I want you to pause and not say that because I believe that Hammond had a deeper problem. He had a deeper problem. Oftentimes we will look at situations and we just merely look at the surface as opposed to going deeper. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you need to go deeper. You need to go deeper. Sometimes it's more beneficial to look more deeply at the issue than the surface. Like Hammond, like Hammond, Many of us are plagued more deeply 
than what we see on the surface. Like, like Hammond, the prodigal son, was dealing with an issue more deeply than that which was on the surface. On the surface, he looked like he was just a rebel. But there was something he was wrestling with beneath the surface. You see, because it, it, it's interesting that the main character of this story, the prodigal son, was, was, was finding himself struggling to eat because uh, 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 Hammond, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this part. Hammond's final words to the friend, to the man who walked from the doorway and, and encountered him, he, he said, man, what are you up to? He, he said, man, I'm just trying to find something to eat. I, I, I'm just trying to get something to eat. And I thought that that was interesting because the prodigal son in Luke chapter number 15 also says that it was at a time of hunger when he found himself eating the pods of a pig that he began to wrestle with his reality. See, a lot of times, a lot of times, it is, our, it is at our time of deep need that we are more reachable than, an, than in other times. I believe this is one of the reasons why the Lord will allow us to get to a, a particular point at times because we, we, until we are hungry enough, sometimes we don't hear as we ought to hear. Uh, until, until we have not had enough satisfaction, we may not dig in our pursuit, our search, as much as we can and should. And so, I want to say to you, that they were in that condition for a reason far deeper than that which is on the surface. Jesus specialized in asking questions. In fact, it's referred to as the law of inquiry. I want to present some questions to you this morning. Why were they in that condition? Why were they in that condition? What drove them to such a low state of existence? Talking about the prodigal son and, and about Joe Hammond, who ironically, his nickname means destroyer. I mean, is destroyer. And, and it's the destroyer of, of the soul who, who stayed on his heels constantly. The third question is, were they able to change the direction in their life? Were they able to change the direction in their life? Before sermon then, I hope to be able to answer those questions. But, you know, these three questions are also viable for us to ask ourselves. If we're in a place and we're dissatisfied with what our current existence is, if, if we believe that we're being denied, if we're being uh, held back, if we're being stripped, you, you may benefit from asking these three questions to yourself. Again, they are, why were they in that condition? So you would make it personal. Why am I in this condition? Number two, what drove me to such a low state of existence? And three, were there, I mean, am I able to change the direction in my life? Am I able to change the direction in my life? I want to suggest to you that the issue that plagued Joe Hammond, the issue that plagued the prodigal son, is also known as an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit is a spirit that will seek to war against your prospering. It will war against your soundness. It will war against you having the abundance in life that God promises us. Jesus said, I've come for this person and a purpose and this purpose only to, to give you life and life more abundantly. Now, there are many theological debates that emerge about what he meant. Did he just mean um, uh, blessing after death when you go to heaven? I can show you biblically 
that he was talking about more than just that. And many of us get snared in thinking that Christ was only talking about life more abundantly in the by and by. He actually is talking about you being satisfied and fulfilled in this life. I didn't say you be rich. I said satisfied and fulfilled in this life. Happy, filled with joy. Otherwise, why would we talk about the joy of the Lord is my strength? So the orphan spirit is warring against us, trying to deny us. Can I tell you that the word orphan is originally in the Greek orphanos? Watch this. It means bereaved. It means parentless. It means fatherless. Bereaved is when I lose something that is valuable to me. Oftentimes we hear about bereavement in terms of lo a loss of a loved one. That's tied to orphan? Parentless. It's important, it's important. So an orphan is one who is parentless, but specifically the definition goes on to say fatherless. Fatherless. So I'm grieving when I have an orphan spirit. There's something in me that's grieving. When I have an orphan spirit, I feel parentless. When I have an orphan spirit, I feel fatherless. Now that's significant, and it's not to be overlooked and understated because because many of us have heard, maybe, maybe you've heard somebody uh, say it this way, that we've got father wounds. Now last week, last week after my wife so aptly taught and explained the father, uh, excuse me, the orphan spirit, I came behind her and I shared my testimony about my orphanness. And see, I told you that I lost my parents from a young age. My mom died when I was 14, and my, my father died when I was 16. But, but I was an orphan long before they gave up the ghost. Because I was fatherless. I told you about how my father, about how my father, you, my stepfather, excuse me, my biological father I'd never met for a long time. And then finally when I met him, I was scared to death. I only saw him two times in my whole life before he died. And then my stepfather used him as a pawn, uh, uh, just like, just like a, a farmer uses a gold to move an animal. My, my stepfather used my, my biological father as a, as a prod, as a tormenting. I'm going to call you, I'm going to call your father. I'm going to call Haywood. And so I had father wounds. I was very transparent, and I, I told mine that some of you are dealing with an orphan spirit too. You're dealing with father wounds. You haven't told anybody. Maybe you don't even realize it, that you've been wrestling with the effects of father wounds or an orphan spirit and you've been wondering why am I in this condition? You've been wondering why am I struggling the way I'm struggling? Why am I wrestling and, and, and it seems like I can't ever get ahead no matter how hard I try. It's a possibility that you're dealing with an orphan spirit. You see, biblically, the blessing comes through the father. That's the reason why when Esau heard that, that, that his daddy had already given the blessing to Jacob, he stood there, the Bible describes Esau as, as a, a, a man of the earth, a man of the wilderness, a man's man. But when he got back having gone hunting and he brought back the venison that his father requested and was preparing to cook it, and his daddy said he had already released the blessing. The Bible says that Esau wept like a baby. 
he cried. He was like, wait, 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 daddy, tell me. There has to be. You got to have another blessing. Give me, give me the blessing. Because he understood that the blessing comes through the father. And it's no wonder then, look at this, the heinous attack of the enemy that we have so many issues with father. See, the truth be told, if we, take, if we took a poll, we would find I'm not the only one who got a father issue. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I'm not the only one who, who's, got, who's got some daddy issues. I'm not the only one who, who is struggling to know who my daddy is. Seen him two times in my, in my life, but I can't tell you a thing about him. Why? Because he was missing. I don't know why he was missing, but he was missing. And then the man, that, that, see, because this is adult stuff. This, I, I, don't know, I don't know why he and my mama didn't stay together. But then the man that she was with, he was a piece of work too. You don't have to say amen. I know I'm hitting you. I know I'm, hit, I, I'm, I'm dinging the pews right now. Because father wounds are what deals with what, what many of us deal with on a daily basis. If you were to go and interview many of the individuals who are in prison, you will find that it's father issues. In fact, here's an, ex, a, 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 uh, an experiment that was done <laughs> in, in uh, uh, Louisiana, uh, the, the, the most notorious prison in the United States, what is Angola. Angola, they, they did an experiment. Coach, this, they, they came and they gave stationery to all of the inmates and told them to write a letter. They gave them special privileges to write a letter on Mother's Day. And they ran out of paper. They ran out of stationery. But then they came back around on Father's Day and did the same thing, and they had stacks and stacks of stationery. You know why? Because of father wounds. Because of father wounds. Many of you are going to score touchdowns. And you're going to look in the camera. And you're going to say, hey, mom. <laughs> Mama, I'm coming home. But only a percentage of you are going to say, Hey, Daddy, thank you, man. Because we got father wounds. Now, if we go back to the text, remember, the blessing comes through the father. If we go back to the text, the text says that the prodigal son went to his daddy and said, give me what's mine. I'm out of here. And for whatever reason, his daddy gave it to him. And he left. And then he went into the world and in prodigal living, he wasted everything that he had. And then he came to himself and he said, even my father's hired servants are eating better than me. Remember, here we are, back to the Eden. They're eating better than me. I got to go back and, and, and I got to get this right. Now, mothers, I need y'all to know I'm not undermining you. I'm not trying to, de to de devalue you. What I'm trying to help you to understand is what the government has understood for a long time. But because, watch this, but because the powers that be want to stay in power, they continue to perpetuate the heinous act of agreeing with the spirit of an orphan. All right, let me, let, me, let me break it down to you and help you to see how, how this is so wrong and so wicked. If, if, we, if we go back in order, in order, I remember as a little guy, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and, and, and not well to do at all, right? And so, uh, so many of the people that I knew were, were on public assistance. We, we used to refer to it as welfare, right? Well, that, that was us too. Right? Do you realize one of the requisites in order to receive support from the city is that you can't have a man in the house? Yeah. 
Okay, wait a minute. Let, let's go back a little bit further. Let's go back to slavery. What the slave master did in order to control is he separated the father from the family. After the father produced numerous babies, then the father was carted off and sent to another plantation. Or the mom and the children were carted off and sent to another plantation. Why? Because the objective is to remove the father. Why? Because the blessing is coming through the father. Watch this. Not only the blessing is coming through the father, but the identity is coming from the father. That's the reason why they say that's Joe's baby. That, that's the reason why they say that's Thomas's baby right there. That's the reason why they say, oh yeah, that's Lewis's little boy right there. Because the identity comes through the father. And so this orphan spirit, as heinous as it is, wants to strip you of your identity. And the prodigal son, it actually succeeded in his life. He lost, he forgot who he was. Why? Because he was mad at his daddy. He had a daddy issue. He had a father wound. And he ran from his identity. He ran from his identity went and started laying with pigs. Eating with pigs. Joe Hammond had daddy wounds. Got coaches and owners coming to see him and offering him $50,000 just to sign his name in 1970. But because he didn't know who he was, he ran from it. He thought he was a drug dealer. He wasn't a drug dealer. He was gifted. He was ordained to reign and to live in a place at the pinnacle of society. But he settled for a pig pen. He settled for the ghetto because he didn't know who he was. Bible says that when he came to himself. Listen, John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14 is where the Bible says something interesting. Jesus says this, I will not leave you as orphans. John 14 and 18. Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Because Jesus knew, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. And, and, and yet, if I go and leave you without comfort, you're going to feel like an orphan. If I go and leave you without presence, you're going to feel like an orphan. If I go and I don't establish you with a sure understanding of who you are, you're going to suffer. Now, now, we know that he said he was talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He says, I'm going to make sure that you have the presence of the Father with you. And see, brothers and sisters, it has been an issue. It has been an issue in families for millennia, for hundreds and thousands of years, where children who have been without their identity, battling an orphan spirit, have made poor choices. Listen, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you. I, I, I'm going to share with you that the orphan spirit blocks or veils the truth from you. An orphan spirit is going to war against you seeing and hearing and knowing as you ought to. And it's going to require that you get to a place of hunger to know where you will refuse to be denied, that you will not settle for anything less until you come into the knowledge of who you are and what God's intent was for you from his inception. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but let me, let, me, let me say this to you because I still believe that, Dr. B, I still don't have everybody tracking with me. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share for you the traits of an orphan spirit. And, and see if this hits you. If it hits you, I just want you to know that you, you don't have to say that's me. You, you and Holy Spirit know, okay? Uh, uh, an orphan spirit, it, it, will, it will make you feel, excuse me, you will not feel a connection with God. An orphan spirit is always making you to feel like you've got to work harder mentality to make up for the lack in your life. Can I tell you something that the prodigal son, when he demanded his inheritance from his father, he didn't do anything to earn it. And so an orphan spirit is going to make you think that you got to earn your blessing. Oh my God. It's going to make you think that you got to earn what God has intended to give you just because you are his child. I'm not telling anybody that there's, you know, you don't have to work. That's not what I'm saying. But there are some things that you don't work for. My babies don't work for being my daughters. They are blessed because they are my child. And there's something that's coming to them just for being. <laughs> just for being. All right, watch this, watch this, watch this. An orphan spirit will make you ashamed to ask for that which is good. An orphan spirit will make you to never feel accepted. You'll wrestle with feeling accepted. An orphan spirit will make you uh, to have a sense of entitlement. Even though you are my child, don't you become arrogant like the prodigal son and think that you are supposed to get anything that you want. An orphan spirit will make you wrestle with anger and fits of rage. An orphan spirit will provide you, uh, I mean, try to keep you in a place of limited understanding. Watch this. An orphan spirit will make you wrestle with abandonment. Abandonment. When I told my testimony, can I be honest with you and tell you that that's what I was wrestling with? I was wrestling because I'm like, why, why does my dad not want me? Why did he abandon me? Why did he reject me? It'll make you, it'll make you struggle with your identity. You'll, some of you will deal with perfectionism. Others of you will struggle to receive the father's love because you have father wounds. So now when the father is trying to love you, you won't even be able to perceive that this is even possible or real because the father who's on, the, on my level in my plane didn't want to love me. So why would I believe he wants to love me? Uh huh. It, it'll make you always be in a place of competition. You'll be emotionally unstable. You'll struggle with relationships. You'll you'll uh, uh, be given to isolation. You'll you'll wrestle with insecurity. You'll you'll be driven uh, to the point of injury. You'll you'll tend to use people. Uh huh. And or, a person plagued with an orphan spirit will even repel people. A person with an orphan spirit will lack self-esteem. A person with an orphan spirit will be limited in their ability to maximize their potential. Joe Hammond had the potential to put 50 on Dr. J, but he struggled to even see why he would take that path. You know, a person with an orphan spirit will be emptiness, will, will deal with emptiness in heart and needy neediness, he, he will, he will uh, always be fighting when he, there is no fight. A person with an orphan spirit will try to medicate their pain. Watch this with deviant behavior. Because they're struggling with their identity. Now listen, my, my great, my great ob objective is to share with you this an interesting point. Because there's a second parable that the Bible talks about. And it is in 2 Kings chapter 13 where we hear the story of King David's son, Absalom. 
And Absalom, we know, we know Absalom, I don't have time to go through the whole story, but Absalom was David's son who came from the, his, his wife, uh, Makar. And, and not only did Makar give David Absalom, but she also gave him Tamar. And David, we know, had a bunch of children, right? And, and one of David's um, other sons from a different woman was by the name of Amnon. Now, the interesting thing about this is that Tamar, Absalom's full sister, was beautiful, so beautiful that Amnon, her half-brother, was in love with her. And he, a, a, a plan was con contrived to, for him to have her because he just could not keep himself together for wanting to be with Tamar. He was overcome by lust. The short story is he rapes Tamar, his half-sister. Watch this. And then after he had his way, he rejected her and left her to the demise of the cultural truths and norms of that age, which means that she was now deemed without value. Watch this. Watch this. So now the word comes to the father. The father finds out that this was done. And the father did nothing. The father did nothing. And so consequently, because the Bible says two years later, for a whole two years, David knew, and he did nothing. In two years, Absalom said, oh, you ain't going to do anything? Okay. I'm going to do it. And the short of it is, he kills, he sets up a plan, and he kills his half-brother Amnon. But can I tell you the reason why this was done was because the father, David, did nothing. We talk about father wounds. So Absalom was wrestling with an orphan spirit of abandonment. The manifestation of abandonment. And it drove him to murder. You see, I'm telling you that you can't take this spirit lightly. You can't take this spirit for granted. Some of the people that are in jail are there because they have been battling and wrestling an orphan spirit. Some of the people are walking the streets like zombies because they're wrestling with an orphan spirit. They wanted the father's approval. They wanted the father's covering. They wanted the father's blessing. They wanted the father's love. They wanted the father's word. They wanted the father's affirmation. They wanted the father's acknowledgement and because they didn't get it. They went down the wrong road. Absalom ends up murdering his brother. Why? Because his father, who was the king, did not step up to the plate and be a father. I need you to understand, brothers and sisters, he was bitter towards his father. He came up with his own plan. He decided to kill his brother. Watch this. And from that point, he gets a reprobated heart, meaning his heart was turned. So now he says, if you're not going to be what you're supposed to be, I'm going to take you out. And he tries to take the kingdom from his father. Why? Because All because of what an orphan spirit does. All because of what an orphan spirit does. Again, this is something that has plagued generations, and this is something that could be affecting you. But how do we overcome this? How do we get through this? Dr. J, I'm so glad you asked. You're the only one who said, come on. So I'm going to come just because you encouraged me 
I'm going to tell y'all how you overcome this. How do I rise above an orphan spirit? How do I get beyond this pain? The first way is we must forgive. We need to forgive for some of us parents. Maybe it's another authority figure that's in our life that misrepresented the Father's love. Forgiveness. Everyone say, help me to forgive, Lord. Forgiving sometimes can be a hard thing to do. But I need you to understand that forgiveness is not about the person being forgiven deserving it. Forgiveness is a decision. It may be that that person actually did everything that you're angry with them about. It's not about them deserving it. It's about you setting yourself free. Somebody say, Lord, help me to forgive. The second thing that you need to do to overcome a spirit of an orphan is to build a relationship with Holy Spirit. Remember in John 14 and 18 when Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. Uh, I, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. He was referring to leaving the Holy Spirit behind. The Holy Spirit being there to help us and to guide us and to bring us into the fullness of who God has called us to. So you need to cry out for the Lord to comfort you and to, to bless you, to enrich you with Holy Spirit. Third thing that you can do to overcome an orphan spirit is to renew your mind with the truth of what God says about you. He is the good, good father. He's the ultimate father. And we need to know what does the father above, the father of lights, from whom all good and perfect things come from, what does he have to say about me? What does he want to do for me and through me? That's what I need to do. I need to figure out what he says. The fourth thing that you need to do is stop looking at other people, excuse me, at other people's yards. Do you know what I mean by that? Stop comparing. The, the, when we compare, we can push ourselves into a depression. Because, listen, as long as you live, somebody's going to have something more than you. As long as you live, somebody's going to have something that's nicer than you. As long as you live, somebody's going to have something that might appear to be better than yours. But the grass is not always greener on the other side. When you actually get over there, you may find that there's so much more to having what they have than you thought. Uh-huh. So, so you, you've been wanting somebody else's wife. She, she just seems to be so much prettier. Do you realize what it costs? When, when you find out what it costs to have all of that beauty, you're going to say, brother, I'm sorry that I ever said anything to her. God bless you. You, you keep her. For those of you that don't know, Coach, I got five daughters. I don't know why God gave me five daughters. One day, my wife took them to the hair salon. It cost $500 to get their hair done. I tell this story frequently. I, I'm just used to a $20 haircut. $500? You better stay in your camp. Thank God for what you got and stop comparing because you don't know what it costs. The fifth thing you can do to overcome an orphan spirit, you can overcome an orphan spirit, uh, excuse me, you can't without letting go of an offended heart. You cannot overcome an orphan spirit without letting go of an offended heart. There was a season in which I was offended by my father's abandonment. So much so that when he stood in front of me, I didn't even want to speak to him. One, I was afraid. The other, I was offended. Let's be honest. I'm a little guy. 
but I was offended. How dare you not want me? How dare you not come and see about me? Then he told me he was coming back to take me school shopping and he didn't show up. I was doubly offended. And I felt justified in it. Can I tell you, when you carry a fence, you will feel justified in it. But it will separate you from the blessing. It will separate you from your blessing. It will separate you from your joy. It will separate you from your peace. Let go of the offense. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Let me hurry up, let me hurry up when I tell you this. In order to overcome an orphan spirit, you've got to explore your inheritance by encountering God. I want you to understand that at that time I did not know who I was and therefore because I didn't know who I was in God, I just lived beneath my inheritance. There's something that God had for me that I had no idea. Who knew that he wanted to use me to carry his gospel and to teach other people and to help them to get free and to help them to understand his love is unsearchable. But at the time, I was blinded by offense. I could not see the way I needed to see. And can I tell you, it was long past my youth that I still wrestled with it. Because I did not understand. I felt justified. Maybe you feel justified in it as well. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. The second, my next to last is in order to overcome, you've got to redefine your win. Let me say that again. You've got to redefine your win. You've got to redefine your win. Some of us are only thinking that we can win if everything lines up the way we thought it should. For Absalom, in order for him to, to win, he had to kill Amnon. In order for him to win, he had to take the throne from David. In order for him to win, he had to steal the hearts of the people from, of, of all Israel. But I need you to know that that cost him his life. The Bible says that his hair was so beautiful that he would get it cut off one time a year and it was more weighty than some of the measurement for gold. That's how much locks he had. His same locks, the glory, his beauty, got caught in a tree and he was pulled him from a horse and he hung by his hair, the glory. The very thing that God blessed him with, hallelujah, it ended up snaring him and he hung there and it was there that Joab, his father's mercenary, killed him. Killed him as he hung on a tree. Why? Because he did not redefine his win. He was offended. An offense took him to his grave. Oh my God. Now watch this. Here's the last thing you need to do to overcome the spirit of adoption. I mean, uh, uh, of an orphan. Is to receive the spirit of adoption. To receive the spirit of adoption. Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 15 and 16. Listen to this. I'm done after I share you this. Romans 8, verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. For the spirit himself bears witness that we are the children of God. I am a child of God. I am the child of God. I should long to get to the place where I say, that's my Abba Father. My inheritance comes from him. My identity comes from him. My peace comes from him. My joy comes from him. Love finds me from him. He is my Abba Father. Stay.
open this moment. Yeah, the doors of the church. But more importantly, I open the altar. I want to offer anyone who is wrestling with an orphan spirit to come to the altar as a sign, as a spiritual act and a sign to say, I'm not going to be hindered by this spirit another day in my life. You may be wrestling with it for one reason and another person is wrestling with it for a different reason. But according to Romans 8, 15 and 16, God lets us know that we don't have to stay in this place. And so if that's you, I want to bless you. I want to repent on behalf of the one who hurt you, who disappointed you, who discouraged you, who abandoned you, who failed you. you don't have to leave this place the way you came. I want to affirm you today with the love of the Father. If that's you, come to the altar. Come to the altar. Come to the altar. I see you. I see you. I see you. I, I see you. I see you. Is there another? I know that there are others. And I want to just say to you, you don't, you don't want to let fear stand in your way. Today marks the day that you're going to shift. You're going to step into your inheritance. You're going to step into, your, into the grace that God has ordained. This is the beginning of you tapping into greatness. I see you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. It won't always be like this Cause God will perfect that concerning me As sooner or later It'll work in my favor It's working out Just for me, just for me. somebody else in the balcony. Refuse to leave this place the way you came. Come in closer. Come in closer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray your grace of love now 
on your sons and daughters who have had father wounds, who have had issues over the years. They've longed for the sense of wholeness and completeness that seemed to evade them for way too long. God, even as I look at them, young and old, I know that the enemy has had too much pleasure down through the years, seeing them with limited returns, seeing them being denied because they've agreed with the wrong story. They, they have denied the grace and the truth that is theirs because they felt themselves unworthy. God, some of them have asked similar questions as I have. Why? Why? Why did it have to be me? Why was I the one at the school event without my father, without my mother? Some of them are bereaved like orphans. Some of them felt parentless at the time when they needed the covering of a parent. And God, at its core, some of them have just wondered, why did my daddy not fight for me? God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would release the balm of Gilead. I proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ as recorded in John 14. I will not leave you as orphans from this point forward. I declare and decree that they will no longer carry the spirit of an orphan. Hallelujah, because they know that they are the father's child, the chosen of you, the beloved God, I pray in the name of Jesus. And as a spiritual father, I affirm this today. Today, God, you put